really nice time and a sad time because we've come to the start of the last day of the summit. And I thought I'd talk about something a little different. I normally do WMI type stuff, as you might have guessed. And I th thought I'd look at PowerShell in a heterogeneous environment. How many people do not have a heterogeneous environment? Wrong. <laughs> do you have? The network doesn't count. It does count. Oh. It's there. You, one of these days, you will end up administering it. <laughs> so I'll skip that. I did that last time. It's, it's not changed much since then. A um, little bit older, a little bit grayer, but apart from that. So I thought I'd have a quick look at what heterogeneity is. I will learn to say that one day. Um, we'll have a look at non-domain remoting, but I'll probably skip that and just cover it as we go. I want to have a look at OMI, which is the Open Management Infrastructure, which is basically uh, WMI for non-Windows. And I want to have a look at DSC on Linux. All good stuff, all scary stuff. Anybody care to give me a definition of heterogeneity? Things that are not the same. Pardon? Things that are not the same. Close. In fact, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take that back. There you go. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> One I came up with. <laughs> Give a book to yourself. <laughs> I want to get rid of it. All right. So we normally think of a homogeneous environment as a single domain, a single Windows domain, because that's all nice. All our credentials work across all the boxes, and everything's nice, dead, and easy. Unfortunately, the way the world is going, that is not going to be the case. You've got DMZ with stuff in work groups, you've got other domains, you've got other forests, you've got all sorts of other toys to play with. You've got some Linux or Unix machines, you've got network switches. Anybody looked at the network switch module in, <coughs> no, apart from you, <laughs> uh, looked at the network switch module in WMF5? Yeah, so. Bartek has done a really good article on, it's the PowerShell magazine you did it for? Thanks, yes. Yeah, a really good article in using that module. Recommend that you have a read of it, have a look at it, have a play with it. And then there's all the non-Microsoft products that have PowerShell in. So those I think of as sort of simple cases. So you've got a whole bunch of things like NetApp and VMware and Citrix and IBM and Q and so on and so on and so on. They all have PowerShell commandlets or OMI, and they are relatively simple to work with. Notice said relatively. They all have little quirks. And then it gets a little bit more complex, and this is where we have to do some more work. And this fits with what I was going to say from the beginning, the OMI and the DSC for Linux. I'll cover the non-domain remote. How many of you are remoting out of your domain or into your domain from a work group? Just two. Wow. OK. We'll come back to that. OMI. Uh, two years ago, I think, it came out. Um, it's basically open source in, in, uh, implementation of a SIM engine that is very low footprint. I think you, it's in Nexus switches, it's in Arista switches. You can get a download and put it onto Linux, which is what I'm going to show you. It's, it works, it's great. It does need quite a bit of work though, which I'm going to show you how it all hangs together. to plug Bartek's blog series on OMI. If you get to start playing with this, read these articles. <laughs> Do not touch it until you've read these articles. Seriously, they are good. <coughs> uh, 
It's got some relatively simple requirements that you can, um, on a Linux machine, that you can just pick up as you're in installing it. The interesting one is the one at the bottom, the pluggable authentication module. Now, as, you, as we go forward, you'll soon realize that I'm not a Linux expert. I can fumble my way around a Linux box and I can make it work, and that's about the limit. But so one of the reasons I wanted to do this was just to see how complicated it was to do, whether it's going to be something that's easy, whether we need more uh, documentation, whether we need, need more examples, and so on and so on. So the, the, the PAM is actually quite interesting because you can plug Kerberos into it and you can get the Linux box to authenticate through your AD. Anybody ever tried that? Yeah? You have fun with it? <laughs> it works. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, Yeah, that's, that's what most people end up doing. It, it works, it is messy, but it is doable. Um, I'm not demonstrating that today because it was a, a mess too far, but it's um, something that I might build in for another time. But the nice thing about that is that gives you Kerberos, which is something that we'll come back to. If you're going to start playing with this, a couple of gotchas. If you're building a machine on Hyper-V, play with this. I'm using CentOS 6.5 because that's what was in all of the examples and I'm not going hunting for different commands on different distributions because there, yeah, no, don't want to. So it needs to be a generation one machine, it needs to have a legacy network adapter and it needs to use an IE disk, IDE disk. If you do not use any of those or not if any of those are missing and you're using something else, uh, it will not work and it will not install. That caused a lot of head scratching one Saturday afternoon while I was trying to put this together. Installing it, uh, make sure the prereqs are installed. That's all in the documentation. You can download it. There's a nice document comes with it that walks you through doing everything. Uh, as usual with anything on Linux, it's all do it yourself. So you download it and you compile it and you make sure that 5985 and 5986 are open. Why do we need those open? Remoting. Beg pardon? Remoting. <laughs> oh. There you go. Right, that's me back under the weight limit. <laughs> yeah. So that you can get WSMAN through it. Uh, you get some sample code, um, it's quite interesting, sort of, and the build process, because um, one of the things that is missing is that you get the uh, server engine for OMI, but there's not a lot in the way of classes come with it, like zero. So you need to create a schema, and it's a you probably recognize this as a MOF file from um, things you've seen so far. You run it through the build process, which is uh, OMI Gen, which comes down with the download. You get a whole bunch of files, and then you make it, and you're good to go. And then you register it. You see all of those in the uh, slides when you get them. A few issues. Um, get SIM class with wildcards doesn't work at the moment. Um, there's not a lot of classes come with it. Um, it really needs some more uh, things there. It needs more examples and it needs more people to try it. Give it a kick, see what you think of it. So that's just forgotten where I put the demo. Right, so that's that looks fairly standard. Create a sim session out to a machine. Okay, if you can read that, the following error occurred while using Kerberos authentication, blah, 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 cannot find the computer. 
Now, I know the computer exists because I've just started it, but we'll just prove it. <coughs> so, what I'm going to do is configure connectivity so it's running unencrypted and I'm going to stick this machine name into the trusted hosts. Is that something that you would do in production? Anybody would? Oh, go on, I bet somebody would. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it does make it nice and easy to work in the demo. The, what should you do in production? SSL. SSL. Are you going to be talking about that later, Jeff? Oh, sorry, I thought it was, thought it was Jeff Wooten's answer that, because he's talking about secure remoting later on this morning. All right. Yeah, SSL. Stick some certs on it and uh, do it that way. I'm just using this method because it um, gets the job done for this demo. Do not recommend you do that uh, in production. Uh, I'm lost. Okay. So we'll try that again. And we've got a sim session established to our um, Linux box. You need to use the credential that you've just created because it gets upset if you don't. And we test WS man working off to the Linux box. If you compare that with what happens with standard Windows box, very, very similar information. Uh, that's one of the nice things about it. It works more or less as you would expect. And we can prove that we're going to um, have the connection because we'll pull some information back. And this is just a basic identifier that um, is created when you install OMI. So you get the system name, vendor, version, blah, 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 whole bunch of configuration stuff. The interesting bit is this bit at the bottom. That's your namespaces. OK, there is one sample class that comes which basically gives you some information about some frogs. Um, it's fine, it doesn't help us manage the machine, but it does show that we can do the standard PowerShell things, so we get the typical sim object back, we get the computer name added in, and it looks just like an object from a Windows machine. We can filter as we would expect, and we can put this one in because Linux and Unix being case sensitive, I just thought I'd see whether it was going over this. It isn't, so that's great. All of the standard PowerShell techniques work. all good. Unfortunately, it doesn't help us actually manage the machine, but it does prove that it's all working. Bartek has written a class 
for this that uh, returns process information. Thank you very much. I looked at that and shuddered and thought, no way am I ever <laughs> going to be able to do anything like that. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. So let's have a look at this because this would be a bit more useful for you administering your machines. Look familiar? Sort of stuff that you get back from Win32 process. You can do the usual. <coughs> and we can filter. <coughs> going to filter on the name of one particular process which is the OMI server and that comes back as you would expect and WQL queries work as well never actually tried it but do the WSMAN commandlets work against this as well they should do in theory yeah but if you want to get into that syntax, good luck. Because it's the, the sim commandlets make life an awful lot easier. Uh, if we look at the object we're getting back, uh, it has some of the <coughs> properties uh, as you would expect. There's still a lot to go in compared to Win32 process. And we'll just finish that off. Useful, right? So if you're looking at the um, things like network switches, they've got OMI installed, but they've also got a bunch of classes for you to use. So that makes life easy. What I think we need to think about as a community is if we're going to have these odd non-Windows machines, we need things that we're used to managing and working with. So we need these uh, similar classes. So the, the, the usual ones, the computer system, the operating system, the disks, those sorts of things would be really useful. If anybody wants to think about community effort to generate some of these, because this is all open source, please let me know. Um, be interested in working with you to get that up and running. <coughs> Any takers? <laughs> okay. The second thing that I wanted to do in was look at DSC on Linux. Um, any, anybody played with that? <laughs> the, us the usual suspect at the back. <laughs> You've seen a lot of DSC this last three days, last two days. Um, that was deliberate because it's a hot topic. It's a topic that's a, a, a game changer for the way we manage our machines. And I make no apologies for the amount of DSC in the agenda because I think it's very important that we all get up to speed on it. So DSC in Linux, it's currently CTP. Um, it says all over it, do not use in production. Um, as with anything, if you're feeling brave. Um, current, I, I've put it there as currently open source because that's what it said on the blog post. I don't know whether the plans are to change that at all. Um, or even if it's going to change. And it is only push mode at the moment. Uh, there isn't a pull server option for this. Current resources available, uh, file, script, user, group, service. If you've looked at the DSC resource kit, those sorts of things should be familiar. Um, there's a few others that we could think of adding there. 
it builds on top of OMI. So you need OMI installed and working, uh, which is why I've done these this way around, because you, you need to get OMI working before you can get DSC working on your Linux boxes. You need to install Python and the Python dev tools. Why does Linux and have such weird names for things? Yum. <laughs> yeah. Uh, download the dim Linux component from GitHub, unpack it, build it. Um, very simple build uh, instructions come with it. Um, even I can manage it. A couple of useful links, uh, a couple of blog posts off MSDN and TechNet. Well worth the read before you uh, get into this. In terms of the Windows side, so this is using, when I say DSC on Linux, this is targeting Linux machines from a Windows DSC box. So you need WMF5, you need to download the Linux resources. Um, again, they come off of GitHub. Um, the resources install in System32 Windows PowerShell modules, not where your normal resources install. Um, it's just a oddity. There is one issue if you're using the September WMF5 <laughs> build. If you, you recognize this as a fairly simple configuration, um, it's just putting a uh, <coughs> file onto W32R2SUS is the node. Ensure it's present. It's a file. That's where it's going to go. That's where I'm pulling the source from, and I'm just forcing it to be there. When you look at the MOF file, you get two extra lines. You get this configuration name, and you get this name. If you are running against WMF4 or Linux or anything that isn't WMF5, it will take it will look at those and go, bleh, don't want to play, not talking to you, all breaks. So you need to chop those out before you do anything with them. Right. Sorry. So we'll close that. We'll look at now, just to, uh, just to prove that this is all working, TMP, virtual root there, then nothing. <coughs> WS server, empty folder. Just, just to prove that there's no smoke and mirrors and this is really happening. Because you do trust me. So I'm going to um, just configure that. Again, wouldn't necessarily do this in production, but it does make it quicker. <coughs> this, uh, we'll just make sure that our <coughs> OMI is working, should be. Okay, so we've got the same stuff back as before, so that's working nicely for us. <laughs> and we'll start with a Linux configuration. So what I'm gonna do is push a file onto that Linux box. Uh, Don's not here, so I can change this back to right host. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to create the credential to talk to that beastie. I'm going to test the configuration just to see what comes back. Um, I've just got some information there about where I want the MOF file to go and the file name and everything else. And then I've got a configuration. 
Now you should recognize this from the stuff that Steve's been doing and everybody else has been doing. Good configuration name. I'm just passing, <coughs> excuse me, just passing the uh, node name in as parameter, importing the resource using the NX file. Sure, it's present, it's a file. That's where I want it to go. And I'm just going to push some contents in because it's the easiest way of doing it. So we'll create the MOF file. I'm just doing a brute force modification to get rid of those two lines. Brute force works. I'm going to apply the configuration and then I'll just test it again and then we'll we'll view the configuration and then remove the sim session so <coughs> the credential did you get that So there's our initial configuration and it's absent. Interesting date. We're creating the MOF file. It's the contents of the MOF file if you've never looked at one. So you get the target node information, you get the date, where it's generated, you get a bunch of stuff about what it's going to do, a lot of which it echoes from the configuration, and then you get the instance information. You can apply it and you get some nice feedback. We test it and you get a true or false, in this case it's working. And then the final view of the, con the configuration. So it's put the file where we told it. It's file, it's present, blah, blah, blah. Time is interesting in that one. It's got the date right, but the time is interesting. So the question is, is it really there? Okay. And just to prove it's real, this is our first DHC test. Excellent. I'm going to repeat this process on Windows Box. Just show you slight differences. So this configuration, the script is basically identical, apart from the fact that it's using the standard Windows file um, resource, everything else just works the same. So we'll, we'll test it, we'll create the configuration, we'll run the configuration, get the MOF file, clean the MOF file up, apply it, test it, view it. <coughs> Yeah, I, that's my setup, I think. Um, I, I was playing with this last night after we got back from the walkout, and it was running really slow. And you know what it's like at quarter past one in the morning? You think, no, nah, that's enough. Um, I, it's something to do with my setup. Uh, don't worry about it, honest. So it's looking at the uh, destination path, it's looking on the machine, it's not there. It's, it's going to generate a MOF file that looks very much like the other one.
you get a lot more feedback when you run it. Um, so it's telling you the system can't find the file, which is the whole point of the exercise. Um, and then it basically goes through and does it for you and tells you how long it took. It tests it and shows you that it was there. And then you can view the configuration and our file is there. And just to prove that that works, there we go. Test one, first DSC test. All cool. Now, I was working through putting this together and I thought, wouldn't it be fun if I could do this? Uh, I want to stick a file on, I want to stick the same file on a Linux machine and a Windows machine. Now this is a trivial example, but if you think of the user options or you think of um, working with the groups, you may have a need to ensure that you've got the same usernames across various machines. So it's a in interesting problem that you may actually come across. So again, I'm just setting some uh, machine names and where I want the moth file to go. Now, if you remember Steve's talk yesterday, he mentioned about the metadata that you can put in. I can't remember whether he showed it or not, but this is this is an example of, of what he was meaning. So you create these hash tables, um, all nodes, and then you give it a node name, and you give it a role, and so that's the Windows machine, that's the uh, sorry, that's the Linux machine, that's the Windows machine, <coughs> and you tell it which one you want to do. And then creating the credentials and the same session that you've seen before. And I'm just going to jump to the bottom of this part of the configuration because it makes more sense to talk about it back to front. So the, the server con... Actually, let me roll that up a little bit. So the server configuration is basically reading all of the nodes, <coughs> and for each of the node names, it's going to go to the role configuration and pick up the role that it wants to apply. And then if we go back up into the roles, so you've got the parameters coming in as the roles. It's going straight into a switch. If it's Linux, it's basically running the Linux config that you've seen before. If it's Windows, it's going to run the Windows configuration. The only thing that's changing there is the contents and the, the file name. Uh, sort out the, <laughs> yeah, don't forget the configuration data. When I was testing this, um, trying to generate the server config, and it wasn't playing, and it was one of those late evening jobs again where you, you have the blinding glimpse of the obvious that you've missed the configuration data out. Do not forget the configuration data. It all falls apart if you do. Clean up the moths, and then just run through the sim sessions and apply the appropriate um, configuration and we'll give that a whirl take a few seconds to run through. So it's applying the configuration to the Linux box, it's applying the configuration <laughs> to the Windows box, and it's done. And if we walk through that, so you can see it's created the MOF files, one per machine. It's applying the configuration to the Linux box, and that looks pretty much like it did before. We tested it, it's true, and it's given us the information. 
it's applying the information to the Windows box. And we test it, get more information back, and then we can view that it's all good. And just to There's the file we've stuck on the Linux box. <coughs> Sorry, wrong one. And there's the file that we stuck on the Windows box. So DC is getting to be quite an interesting beast now that we can configure our Windows machines, we can configure Linux machines. As I said at the moment, this is a CTP, it's a limited number of resources, um, but it has a lot of possibilities. Interested in using it? So it's a question. What language are the resources for Linux? What language? You mean what? what Hey, beep, beep, beep. Yeah. Over time, we will extend that, and we will provide you a way to write Python, providers in Python. We don't have that now, but we'll be able to do that. Uh, and then once we have that mechanism worked out and open source, there are some partners that we've talked to who are interested in extending that to then go do uh, Java, et cetera, other languages. But in general, you can get quite far with the built-in providers. <coughs> So the, the so the, 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 the question was what were the resources written in? The answer was that they're, they're more files and you can't extend them at the moment, but eventually you will be able to write your own in Python. So So, looking at those two and extending our Windows management techniques across parts of our environment, uh, OMI, it works, it does uh, a good job, it works as the way we would expect it to work from using SIM. We haven't got a lot of classes, so uh, anybody interested in writing those, a uh, nice community effort would be there. The DSC resources, it all seems a little odd to me that they go in a different place. Standardization is great. Uh, is the DSC resources ever going to hit the DSC resource kit? <coughs> are, the, are the Linux DSC resources going to get rolled into the resource kit at any time, or is it always going to be a separate? Right now it's separate. I haven't really thought about it. Okay. Uh, it's just that. From a, a usability point of view, if you've just got one place to go, it would be a lot, a lot, lot easier. Yeah, well, right now, so to be clear, right now the, um, the the Linux stuff is a little bit behind where the Windows stuff is, and it's a source code distribution. It's not a binary distribution. So at some point, when it becomes a binary distribution, that makes sense. Okay, that makes sense. And the the last one is m more resources. Jeffrey already answered that one. The, that at the moment you can't, but it is coming in the future. Any questions, observations, comments, offers of buying beer? <coughs> Adrian? Just, just a, a word of caution on this. If you're actually trying to install OMI on BSD systems, not on Linux, what you're going to end up with is a lot of wasted hours because it won't compile because it's, it's built around build tool, I think, and it, it will compile on HPUX, Solaris, all, all the strange things, but it won't compile on BSD. 
So what what you will probably end up doing is uh, doing something like package search for OMI, and you will find one that's that's called OMI dash some something that looks like a timestamp, and it's not this. It's com <laughs> something completely completely different, like an FTP uh, mirroring sync tool, something. Okay. And yeah. Okay, so the, to, to summarize, if you want to run OMI <coughs> on BSD, don't. don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually tried myself, and I wasted, as you said, a lot of hours yeah. on, uh, open BSD, and it's not available, on free BSD, it's not available, Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we should share the pain and actually yeah. make it. Don't put it on PSD. <laughs> 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 no, it's, it's, they're honest about it. They don't mention BSD as part of the platform. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Or yeah, another question. But uh, I also read somewhere on, on the internet that someone could build something for uh, Apple. I don't know if anyone will try it. It, it. I think it will compile on Asterix because Darwin is supported in, in build tool, so it uh, could, could work. I've not seen anything. Um, if you want to send a link, I'll put it into yeah. the uh, the stuff that we make available just for general education purposes. And I'll make sure that there's a comment about the OpenBSD and uh, BSD uh, being an issue <coughs> as well. So one at the back. Uh, so, uh, I, I think, I, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that Mac is also based on the BSD Mac OS. Yeah. So, if that does get in, will, will all of these work on a Mac? Okay, so, so, that, so if that works, does yeah. that mean we can use these to manage Macs? So, the, the, the question was um, can this be done on a Mac? And the answer from the floor was that it seems that OMI is, somebody's put one together for Max, so in theory, yes you can. The issue will be, have you got the classes to do it? So you, you get the server up and running, but um, do you have the, the actual classes to, to actually do anything productive with it? I think the only way you'll be able to answer that is to give it a whirl. And that would be a great topic for next year. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> Please see me afterwards. All right, any more questions? In that case, thank you very much. We'll wrap this session up. And I'll push the button. Right. If you'd like to grab yourself